All right, I think we can start. Um, thanks for coming, everyone, and welcome to the forum this week. We we are fortunate enough to have a, an external speaker this uh, afternoon. So Lorenzo Yasoni works at the Armin Street Hospital. Lorenzo is Italian, obviously, as you can tell from the name, because he spent most of his career uh, working in the UK, right? So he trained uh, in Italy, uh, in Rome, I believe. He went to medical school and then uh, specialty in general where he's from and i guess most of the last you won't say how many years but uh, no, 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 no. years has been working in the uk years. so this is uh, an opportunity for us to get some insight on pediatric nuclear medicine which is something we get uh, very little exposure to and so Lorenzo is going to give us uh, his take on this great thank, thank you, you very much Luigi. thank you and uh, thanks for inviting me to this so as we just said i'm a nuclear medicine physician i've been working at great almost with about 20 years and um, at GOSH, we have a setup whereby, um, talking about neuroblastoma, uh, we have a spec CT system. We don't have a PET present, uh, and we send our patient for PET to a nearby University College of London. So we have some PET exposure, but not as much as we probably would like, because clearly UCLA just made the a, a general hospital, a very busy with other practice, and, and certainly we do very good scans. Uh, but uh, the theory is of the also uh, on site, so having to refer elsewhere is also an element of uh, for this adds to the complication. So, anyway, so um, just to the system worked before, but it doesn't seem to be working now. So, um, Okay, just to have an idea of how we, with regard to neuroblastoma, uh, how does it um, um, situated within pediatric oncology? As you can see from this graph, the majority of uh, pediatric malignancies are hematological malignancies between leukemia and lymphoma here. And then there is this whole area of, of uh, brain tumors, about 20%, you can see there. This is just miscellaneous. This is why it's a fairly large portion of it's a miscellaneous tumors. And within the, the solid tumors, really neuroblastoma is it's not a huge portion, but it's probably the, the larger portion of the extracranial solid tumors in, in peas. And now uh, neuroblastoma is a malignant manifestation of aberrant sympathetic nervous system development. So the sympathetic nervous system development, how the cells develops, and aberrant, but then malignant, because it could be benign as well. It's, it's a better um, manifestation of, of the development, a sympathetic nervous system cell. And um, as you can see from here, it's about 50% uh, of uh, children are like younger than five years of age and the medium of 19. So this means that it's very difficult to scan them. And uh, immediately they start thinking the need of uh, general anesthesia or sedation is certainly uh, important to, to consider this group of patients. And the other thing to bear in mind that uh, at least half of them, so in some uh, case here is more than half, present with um, high risk features. This really is, is a major uh, point to bear in mind because this means that they go into a management pathway that is very complex with uh, uh, lots of potential side effects. And the also of high risk neuroblastoma, the overall survival is still not great. Now, this is uh, summarized a bit the development of, of the uh, uh, precursor of the sympathetic nervous, uh, nervous system cell. Clearly, the details of this are well above me, yeah, but just to know there are several steps uh, for the cells until it becomes uh, the noradrenergic uh, neuron, sympathetic neuron, or the cholinergic neuron. Or this, at any stage of this development here, things can go wrong. And then the cell can take a, a, a wrong path. And the earlier this, this starts, then the further away the cells will be from the uh, normal development. So these are the two type of um, categories of, of neuroplastic tumors, basically the neuroblastoma, which is actually malignant phenotype, and then the more benign phenotypes. You can see 
שול האינסטרום הכדי פה, או לא סוף פה, כי אפשר להסתכל על זה, ומור בניין ניר בסי צ'ומר כאן בניורומה, and then some will be in between with some in undifferentiated elements this is this is uh, more the stroma pole so it's going towards slightly more malignant and then the different degrees of uh, neuroblastoma starting with the undifferentiated where the cells are really uh, very little resemblance to the normal uh, sympathetic cells to a much better differentiated cell so so different degrees of different also clinical behavior on this This is, uh, things haven't really changed that much since this article here now eight years ago. And the survival, as I mentioned, is about, uh, for high risk neuroblastoma now, is about uh, still here, about five years above, about around 50% and so on. Now, the prognostic factors, which is, is important to bear in mind for neuroblastoma, clearly age with the more favorable uh, prognosis is younger than 18 months. The stage, the histology, the differentiation, and then there's some sort of chromosomal anomalies here, the cloidid and the amplification of some oncogenes. So in other words, all this can be considered somehow as surrogates for underlying tumor biology. So the biology of, of neuroblastic tumor, in particular neuroblastoma now, is more and more the most important prognostic factor. And this is then sort of somehow measured or assessed by the, uh, for example, the FISH examination on the uh, MIC oncogene, this is oncogene is amplified, or the chromo chromosomal anomalies can be anomalies or aberrations. There is a favorable biology, you reduce the therapeutic intensity if the other protein category intensify the treatment. Now, the stagings are made simpler in the last uh, probably 10 years or so. It's basically essentially where the tumor is localized on the peak. And localized can be um, locally advanced, which would be L2, with uh, kinds of one or more imaging defined risk factors. So, this is why imaging is so important in this stage, but, or with no imaging defined risk factors, so really, which is quite easy to assess surgically. And M stands for metastatic, so it can be distant disease. Uh, distant disease doesn't necessarily mean um, sort of uh, skeletal disease, it can also mean. Uh, distant metastasis in the lymph nodes. Yeah, so example, this one is a special category, and SS stands for special if you are in Anglo Saxon countries, stands for cycling if you are in German speaking countries. I remember one occasion uh, a, a distinguished colleague from the German uh, speaking world that, that uh, when I said that uh, uh, S stands for special, I said, not true. This is, uh, it may be in your place, but in, 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 in the German uh, world, that means with a child. Uh, is sort of we uh, getting into the more solid type of nutrition rather than just being nourished with milk. Anyway, so this is, is, a, is a tumor in some ways younger than 18 months. In the past, it to skin, liver, and bone marrow. This is an example of the imaging defined risk factor, which is also clearly very important also for, for, for imaging. So for example, you see you have the encasement of the aorta here in this image here as well, the extension, intraspinal extension here, And then intracranial extension here with encasement of a carotid artery there. And then again, the spinal extension with the invasion of the neuroforamina here. And then clearly the, the, the sort of CDEC uh, trunk also encased, etc. So these are some of the imaging fire risk factors. And with regard to metastasis, clearly neuroblastoma, but distant metastasis. Uh, the, the, the organ where by far is uh, the more sort of common site of metastatic disease is the, the skeleton, so bone bone marrow, you can see here, in the vast majority of cases, metastatic disease is found there. Liver, uh, much less, but certainly possible. Lymph nodes, fairly common. And lung and brain, not so common, especially brain can be about five, eight percent of cases, lungs less, but certainly metastasis in the skeleton. Now, this, this cartoon uh, summarizes the how uh, high risk neuroblastoma is planned. And this is very relevant also for molecular imaging, because uh, molecular imaging will try to get an idea of the, of the tumor characterization and the uh, metabolic response to, to manage. So it's basically made based on three uh, sort of mainstays of therapy. One is induction chemotherapy, you can see. Induction chemotherapy main, means that the, the, the tumor has to be made operable. So as a neuroblastoma tend to be infiltrative in nature, so it tend to really invade, encase vessels, invade nearby organs, extend, 
contract. So it's really difficult to, to, to surgically resect. So the, in touch of chemotherapy, uh, the idea is to make it operable. You know, from a situation, very often, the vast majority is inoperable at the start. And clear at that point, uh, you also try to uh, uh, sort of shrink and reduce the bulk of metastatic disease. And I understand that clearly, if there's any uh, pediatric oncology here, will correct me, but my understanding is that uh, if you have up to three areas of, or less of uh, um, uh, metastatic disease in the skeleton on MIDG, three or less hotspots is still, you can go ahead and operate if it's surgical resected. Once you've done that, then you can go for surgery. Then uh, it comes to a point, a time of eradicating the non-visible disease. Because clearly, neuroblastoma high risk is, is a systemic disease. So I can see here the high dose chemotherapy is to basically eradicate the group of cells that are not visible in radiology, but are still there. And then, uh, and then it comes to the um, consolidation therapy. So keep radiotherapy of the primary tumor. This is often the case because often the uh, primary uh, uh, disease, you, you don't have clear margins for the surgery. And then you, can, you need the radiotherapy to sort of uh, sterilize and try to reduce the chances of local control. And then in the end, it's the maintenance therapy, which is nowadays have mainly uh, given with immunotherapy, with anti-GD2 molecular antibodies, or cis acids. So this is the, so you can see it's very complex. High risk management is very complex and molecular imaging has got a very important role in here. The radiological imaging of blastoma clearly is doing uh, the staging and the value of the response. The staging uh, really, um, you, 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 really, you, you assess the relation of your primary tumor with the surrounding structures and cross-sectional imaging, especially with vessels. And, and uh, um, the molecular imaging you do, like a cold body overview, you assess region of distant disease, you also do tissue characterization. And clearly, uh, uh, in the pre surgical setting, then clearly you, you need the cross sectional imaging to assess from imaging the kind of risk factors in plant surgery and to molecular imaging to see if there is any um, metastatic disease still there. So, this is like from the recent, fairly recent guidelines five years ago, were published. Um, in the group of molecular in stage of disease therapy plan and follow up. So these are the, the tracers that are available. The gamma camera spec tracer, you can see here it may be an IBG, IB131. There are a number of countries in the world where IB1 and IBG is not available and not a not an insignificant number. So this is what but clearly IB for one is far from ideal a tracer because the high radiation goes and then the, the, the less and the reduced sensitivity of the gamma camera to, to prevent it because of the um, physical property value of the one. And we have the PET tracer that can distinguish between the catecholamine energy tracer and non catecholamine energy tracer. So you can have two, but you have RB124, it might be G, PET. And this is a very interesting one. There's a more recent one uh, fluorine MFBG is a very basically is a MIBG but labeled with fluorine 18. This to me, this is a revolutionary trace is going to change really. Uh, I, I suspect if it becomes more and more clinically available and adopted now in Europe, I understand there are two or three centers that have started routinely to use it. But if it becomes more available, I think this will be the trace of the future for the universal. And then there are the non catecholaminergic tracer, which are PG and daughter peptides. Really, it's very interesting on this part for the theranostic approach, which is really now more and more clearly uh, molecular imaging and molecular radiotherapy are coupled together. So, also in neuroblastoma, this theranostic approach is very much uh, part of the game. So, we have this at the moment, the RD1 to 3 MBG and ID131 molecular radiotherapy of a daughter paid scan with PET CT and the teeth and daughter paid molecular radiotherapy. So, very much. Now, uh, as I said, my clinical experience is mainly on MIBG. As I said, although, although we see the, we have the PET scan referred to our colleagues at UCH that come back to us, and so we have some, clearly some exposure, but not as sort of much as we would like because of clearly the limitations having to outsource the service. Now, clearly, MIBG is a story. A success story of radio pharmaceutical because it was introduced in clinical use something like about 40 years ago. And this is William Bayer Waters from, from Ann Arbor, Michigan, who is the one who first developed, uh, used clinically this tracer. This is from his first paper. 
on the Ethiochromocytoma, IBM 3 one and IBG, published now in 1986. And this is an analog of norepinephrine. And so it uses a norepinephrine transport. Uh, and uh, um, it is taken up where there is no epinephrine uptake. And as you can see here, this cartoon, there is another one that is probably slightly uh, uh, clearer. This one here shows the uptake of the MIBG. So, first of all, the norepinephrine NE here uh, comes from tyrosine, it becomes dopa, becomes dopamine, and then it's internalized in this vesicles here. And then when the stimulus occurs, this is re released. In the synaptic cleft here binds to the receptor, and the amount in excess is taken up by this uptake one mechanism and is internalized again in the cells. So you have to remember that MIBG is a marker of this mechanism only and nothing else. So this is an important point to me. So when there is MIBG uptake in tumor, in your rusty tumor, it's because this uh, mechanism is enhanced. So it is, it's not a mark of anything else, just of this, which is got relevance also for regarding some factories. So, and what has been shown in some study, this is uh, Stephen Dubois from the, the um, uh, SMMMI um, uh, CGOG uh, pediatric uh, sort of group, that the MIBG uptake correlates with the an enhanced expression of gene encoding the norepinephrine transport there. So you can see here, non avid tumors, but avid tumors got more enhanced expression of this uh, norepinephrine transport there here. So confirming that is a marker of, of this mechanism, which I just showed before. And, and, and this other uh, group of researchers from Japan have shown that the MRBG uptake is also somehow correlated with secreting activity of catecholamines in, in uh, pheochromocytoma. So you can see here, in, in, uh, which is again, is an interesting pattern. Again, MIBG uh, is a marker somehow related to catecholamine secretion and, and nothing else. Yeah, so, and, uh, so it's interesting, it's different to FDG, for example. So it's, this is relevant for other things that we hopefully will come to cut a bit. So uh, about eight, Percent, eight to ten percent, depending on the case series so of neuroblastoma, are MIBG non avid So they don't show this uh, enhanced uh, enhancement, this transport, and there's no uptake. And they've been shown, this, again, in this same study here, and uh, published in Pediatric London Cancer, that um, these tumors are behaving quite well, actually, from the point of view of clinical uh, uh, event free survival or over survival. And so it's quite, quite good to be in MIBG one. So the uh, MIBG scintigraphy in neuroblastoma clearly has been shown with high sensitivity for localization, got good prognostic value. And recently, in the recent uh, seven, five, seven years or so, there have been the studies on the SIOP and the CURI scores, and they show the bulk of MIBG disease, both the diagnosis and uh, following treatment, has got productive significance. So, so it's an interesting um, thing. But it's, uh, in the, um, uh, the MIBG synthetic neuroblastoma, as, as I mentioned, uh, some neuroblastic tumor can be non avid You can see here is an example of that. You can see all this area here on spec CTs, clearly no uptake on MIBG at all. It's a photopenic area on planar images there. And this is an example, you can see, of an avid tumor. This here in the right paraspinal region is a retroperitoneum. A diagnosis strongly avid. Only in chemotherapy, then becomes almost entirely non avid. You may say, well, there's a minimal residual uptake, but uh, this could also, maybe it could also be, anyway, it's probably some low, very low grade, but by and large, it's, it's almost entirely non avid. Now, on cleaner images, now, uh, what I'm going to cover are some features of the MIBG imaging, and then um, a bit more, I would like to dwell a bit more on the meaning of MIBG uptake, what, what are we images? So, uh, so uh, cleaner images, that uh, is clearly, as a, uh, we start with that. But for example, the full view of the scale is quite important. You can see here, the, in this very young child, all this uptake here around in the orbital area, et cetera, superorbital region, but also base of skull. You can see this area here, base of skull is uh, abnormal. Yeah. And this is following chemotherapy, rapid cogent, the TVD. And you can see there is still 
by the other is some low grade residual disease in basal skull volume. The point I'm trying to make is for plenary images, I, I believe that the end of drug control is real. So, but the full view of the skull are quite useful because you can see here, you can uh, see lesions in skull base that otherwise would be quite difficult to, to, to identify. And now uh, the, the recent guidelines state that the state of the art images can require spec CT uh, and uh, uh, really are developed and reduces significantly almost to zero the, the uh, number of, of uh, equivalent scans. Uh, and uh, if it's low dose, it gives very little like some radiation, contrast enhanced, it can avoid another contrast enhanced CT. So, so I'll show some example of that. As I said, the low dose or contrast. Etc. Depending, we, we tend to do contrast enhancement only only in the preoperative setting when the contrast diagnostic quality CT avoids another uh, CT in, in the CT department. How, so how is it going to happen? Because the child is to be absolutely still. So one can use this type of device, inflatable devices, to give a child still, etc. But in the majority of our patients, especially this age group, it's quite difficult. We um, yeah, sedation of general anesthesia, I think, is, is quite important, and, and we really do it. Now, the environment is, is, is really important. You can see, this is our scanner, but uh, um, if we, if the scanning room is like that, it can be quite uh, frightening for a child. The pose is very tall, in <coughs> other the, the height of a child, well, that's a distant level here. Seeing this tall, uh, all sort of very clinical type of area can be quite intimidating. Now, we have a system whereby uh, scanning, if especially someone not on the GA, is not so frightening because we can change the light, like, and we have a screen here on the ceiling. You know, we can show video and everything, the, the image is projected on the wall here as well. I mean, uh, the, the, the color can change, you'll see it here, and then the, the different, uh, uh, some children got us a favorite color, so you can put that and check every five seconds of any project. And then, uh, and we have also a, a, a stereo system. Now, let's see if this works. It worked before, but uh, it may not work now. Um, you get to remove the pointer and... Ah, uh, uh, okay. So, so, oh. So this this one is not just to create a, a fancy type of nice environment, but it's really it, in our practice it really helped a lot to basically avoid the general anesthesia in the number of patients. And uh, for example, bone scanning, spec CT, now is a different area, of course, but uh, uh, the child has to lie there on the scan uh, table for half an hour or so. The same, it might be G, not on the GA. Uh, same, a long, a long examination. And if they have an, some sort of entertainment, they forget to get the scan. They are much more cooperative and much more sort of uh, basically absorbed into following something. And then they, 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 they will move, basically, and they end up going. Yeah. So, um, as I said, that is uh, GA, we do GA in a number of patients. So, now some examples how spec CT can improve an acquisition authorization. You can see here, this, we, we just wonder what is this area here. And then uh, in the uh, left side of the abdomen, and then we can do spec CT here. And then you can see it's a normal distribution trace in the colon, so nothing to worry about. But otherwise, you can say, well, this new mass lesion. Right? And this, this is a quite an interesting case. This was a child who was treated for local advanced uh, primary neuroblastoma diagnosis with a piendo treatment scan. And you can see on planar images, there is a normal distribution in the colon here, normal uptake in the uh, left adrenal here, maybe right adrenal, normal liver, heart, etc. I wonder what this thing is. Is it just a normal in the in just an area of more prominent uptake in the distribution in the colon or something else? So spec CT is here shows naturally no, this is a lymph node. Yeah, it's a, an autocable lymph node that is in there. And now the child also, this was a it's a beginning of spec CT, et cetera. And we did double check, and this is where you can see this. This was resected and the neuroblastoma proven relapse. 
of disease. And this is another thing. You can see here, this area of primary neuroblastoma here in the right supraglinal region, this area of low grade uptake in the uh, sort of axilla there is anything uh, of any significance. Clearly, there was also this uh, uh, lymphadenopathy and non avid in the, in the uh, abdomen there. And this area of avidity, it was a lymph node which uh, was resected and was proven to be uh, ganglion neuroblastoma intermix on, on, on uh, pathologies. Now, this is another example of um, a, a neuroblastoma uh, uh, here. Uh, in, in, in sort of baseline scan. You can see the primary in the mid abdomen extending past spinal inferiorly. There's an area here in the, in the thoracic ringlet. Nothing in the spine, how we can see it. Well, just, just, just this area here, which is in, in, in the, 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 at the area of the, the, the spine posteriorly. There's a new thing, a new focal area of abnormality. Sorry, I haven't got the, the, the links of that. So in this area here, the mid thoracic spine there, and and one wonders what what this is, yeah. And, and you can see a spec CT. This area of intraspinal disease that is is um, uh, sort of confirmed on on there, and then that is the acid views there. So new intraspinal disease confirmed. And the other thing here was of EMR showed this lymph node here in the um, retrocable position there. And uh, well, uh, it, it, it raised the suspicion of residual disease there. But you can see on an IVG scan, it's entirely non avid the calcifications. Yes, probably some treated disease, but nothing really, there would be nothing avid, so nothing sort of ongoing. So probably just the, the treated disease and nothing to worry about. So, and we also can do, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, in contrast enhanced CT scanning for in the for surgical planning uh, in the preoperative in IBG. You can see a case like, like this, this um, localized primary immune blastoma after chemotherapy. And the question is, is it resectable? And you can see on CT that the tumor invades the periportal spaces there. And then uh, this one's there. So clearly, at the moment, it's still inoperable. So, some further chemotherapy is necessary. It's another one here, you can see this residual neuroblastoma after chemotherapy in the right and supraglinal region. The specificity clearly shows that the tumor still encases in the left renal vein, a part of the right uh, renal artery there as well. So, so uh, they decided to give some further chemotherapy to maybe hopefully to shrink this a bit more and, and hopefully uh, and actually the child went to high dose and, and hopefully to, to uh, so that this right kidney or left kidney could be not at risk. This is, a, you can see, it's a, is a, a, a very avid a neuroblastic tumor. It's actually ganglion neuroblastoma intermix. You can see on MRI, it in the lesion, uh, 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 left, left side of the thorax extending to the neck. But we did the contrast CT. You can see lots of imaging defined risk factors here. And it's here, the ostrich are displaced on there, and then the tumor also uh, encases the aorta, compresses the left main bronchus. And uh, again, here, uh, this is encasement of the left vertebral artery there. The common cardiac artery is also encased. And the left pulmonary the artery is encased and compressed, you can see there and there. So, so lots of. There are uh, methods to quantify the, the uh, bulk of disease. You can see the cyber method in Europe, the Curie score in the United States, North America, and the different ways of basically all quantifying the bulk of disease in the skeleton and the soft tissue there. And this has been shown to have prognostic uh, value. You can see here a diagnosis if a, a, a neuroblastoma has got less than three hotspots or less into the better category, then it got more than three hotspots. And the same after induction chemotherapy here. So this is a QE score we normally routinely use in clinical practice. Now, we come now to a, a, the second part, I think, which I find a bit, a, a quite interesting myself. Yeah, there's a, uh, we'll ask the question, how much disease are we targeting with IBG, and what is the meaning, especially for my behavior? So this expect CT has shed light on this, also clinically, which we didn't have much an idea before. So we are talking about the biological heterogeneity of neuroblastoma, the relationship of MIBG uptake and DWI and ADC mapping, and uh, 
the if there is any relationship between the uptake of the MIBG and the cellular differentiation. I believe we are, with MIBG, we are seeing a bit of a tip of the iceberg, a very significant portion of neuroblastoma which you don't see in the MIBG. And also what we see may not necessarily be, uh, the uptake not necessarily be related to aggressiveness of disease. And so this area is, I think, quite interesting to, to explore a bit more in depth. So let's go a bit initially for some cases on this idea of biological heterogeneity in neuroblastoma. You can see here this five year old young boy. Uh, it, it got bilateral renal masses, both biopsy, both neuroblastoma. You can see on MR how differently they, they, they look like. You can see this uh, mass here, suprarenal, very different uh, texture compared to this one. And because this one on the right side is completely a MIBG added. This woman is completely non added. And then, if you follow uh, industrial chemotherapy, you can see here the avid, the avid bit shrinks, and, and is, but it's still avid. And you can see here, see the other one is, uh, also shrinks on, on this is a low dose CT, but, but uh, it keeps entirely non added. So, two, both neuroblastomas. Undifferentiated, both undifferentiated, but one is completely avid, the other one completely non avid. So, biological heterogeneity of neuroblastoma. Another example here, you can see this on MR, this very large uh, primary tumor extending into posterior mediastinum in the retrochloral region, etc. You can see uh, encasing all the vessels there. And on an IVG at diagnosis, only minimal, minimal avidity you can see here at the um, sort of uh, posterior mediastinum inferiorly, there are some two focal and the rest is entirely non-avid, but the skeletal disease is totally avid everywhere. So all so we have a, a discrepancy here of avidity, minimal avidity in primary, and the metastasis all avid. Again, biological heterogeneity of neuroblastoma. We are picking up some disease and we're missing quite a lot of disease with, with my BG. So this is another case. You can see here a uh, massive primary mass lesion extending contralaterally. You can see on MR some abnormal signals on this uh, uh, spine here and uh, lobulated lesion, poorly differentiated neuroblastoma on pathology. And on MIBG scanning, you see that uh, primary lesion again is, is avid, but the metastatic lesion that uh, the MR showed in the spine is entirely non avid. So again, biological heterogeneity in the we are identifying some disease with my region, we are missing other diseases. So, and, and this is another example here. This is massive primary tumor here in the abdomen, extending again by the retrocurrent region, the posterior mediastine on contralaterally, pushing the aorta, displacing the aorta anteriorly, and look how, how irregular and lobulated mass lesion is. Look at the primary images here, you can see. Looking at this planar image, we wouldn't have an idea of how much portion of the student is non avid. But if we compare now the MRI with SPEC CT, you can see this area here in the posterior spine of extending subclubal positions is all avid. Uh, the vast majority of the primary disease in the abdomen is non avid, with just this little portion here gives some of avidity. This pre sacral node here shows very low grade avidity there. So again, Biological heterogeneity of neuroblastoma and the MIBG targets a, a proportion of cells but misses or doesn't target the others. You can see there's no relation in contrast enhancement, as you can see here, or this is a, 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 and, and, and no relationship with DWI and AC mapping. This area is high, a restricted diffusion there, very avid. This area also highly restricted diffusion on MR as entirely non avid. So, so. We have done the study ourselves, uh, comparing the MIBG uptake with uh, ABC mapping. As you can see here, the different degrees of MIBG ability, the ABC value is the same. So it's not related. And the same here, also post chemotherapy, very similar results. Uh, um, MIBG ability of the primary that increases, and the ABC mapping doesn't increase much. So, um, so this is basically. 
um, the changes in MIVG avidity are independent from EDC changes. This was uh, one of the main points of this of this uh, paper that we did, from, from, uh, we did it together with the researchers. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, how the response uh, of primary neuroblastoma to, uh, to chemotherapy can be. You can see here this um, massive uh, MIBG of disease on MR, lots of populated, so called uh, primary extending contractory. And for chemotherapy, all this area of avidity entirely uh, show no, no, show, no uptake at all. So the abnormal uh, is, is resolved. To say, well, uh, excellent, we've done a good job, so no residual, uh, it might be uh, viable tumor remaining. But unfortunately, it's not the case. You can see here on the primary neuroblastoma, once it's tied, there's still, um, uh, it might be G, there are still viable uh, tumor uh, uh, cells present. So, so uh, it might be G positive neuroblastoma becomes negative, can still harbor. Uh, viable cells. And we, we did in, in our study, also we also published recently ourselves, uh, if it was less than 10% viable tumor, this, this tumor had a better uh, survival if compared to the group where more than 10% viable tumor was remaining in the surgical specimen uh, following. So uh, uh, sometimes we, we have the opposite things. So we have seen an example of, of a patient, a neuroblastoma that following chemotherapy and partly resolved, the, the, the ability resolved. This is an example where there is no resolution at all. So you can see here the primary is very avid and following chemotherapy is still very avid. So we even slightly more, but it's still avid. So, and we, we uh, it's a sort of refractory neuroblastoma. Uh, we did uh, in the same study, we compared uh, the group with, with some response. You can see the green and blue curve of some response to the primary, so the ability reduced, compared to the group where there was no response at all. And the group with no response at all did worse than the other. It was 68 patients, all high risk neuroblastoma, all treated the same way, all had a MIBG and MRI and diagnosed and after induction chemotherapy, etc. So these are an interesting results of this group of refractory neuroblastoma. So uh, the response of hematary in primary tumor is correlated with better survival. And this is another example of MIBG uptake and differentiation. So this is, is an example of well-differentiated primary neuroblastoma, and look how avid the uptake is. Yeah, well-differentiated. It's supposed to be more within the malignancy, behaving in a slightly more benign fashion than a poorly differentiated, but it's still very avid uptake. And this is a poorly differentiated neuroblastoma, it's still avid uptake. Yeah, so, so it might be G uptake find it difficult to distinguish between well differentiated and poor differentiated neuroblastoma. And, and I have this is an extraordinary case that uh, <laughs> I, I want to show because it's, uh, uh, to me is it, it, it once it illustrates this point. Yeah, this was uh, you can see this this scan was done many years ago, almost thirty years ago. And in those days, apicogia did not exist. You can see this was the primary tumor here, very avid. This was the induction chemo. See how much disease still remains in the skeleton. So the, the patient was discharged. There was nothing else to offer. Just the uh, uh, cystretinoic acids was on, on this therapy there. And she represented nine years later, everyone thought it died. But, then, uh, but you see, uh, still the large lesion there, all necrotic in the middle. And, but this area here is avid, and this area here is also avid. And, and this was on biopsy differentiating. So it was on cystic acid that uh, basically facilitated the differentiation into a more benign uh, variant. So it should survive nine years. So this is another point to show, to make this point that MIBG uptake does not distinguish between poorly differentiated and well differentiated neuroblastoma. It's not a marker of aggressiveness and malignancy, which they said it should be studied a bit more in depth, I think. But we have some case, and a different case at the moment, that we are planning to put together in, in a sort of study. So it's an example, to finish on this point, of the opposite. That basically, uh, the uh, tumor, you can see uh, quite well differentiated neuroblastoma, very, very massive primary there. Um, following chemotherapy becomes more of it, but the tumor is smaller in size. So it responds, but it becomes uh, more of it. So this means uh, it was on pathology identified as 
differentiating you know, this. So, so to conclude on this area here of MIBG, so clearly MIBG spectrity is a highly sensitive, specific, well-established. Yes, as used is used in all clinical trials in young astronomers. At the moment, it is a cardinal examination of this. It's very useful because it goes a pronostic approach. Uh, the main thing of MIBG is a high specificity. There's no uptake in reactive uh, bone marrow, which we have with the G, for example. Now, uh, specificity has shed some light on, on things. So, for example, here, uh, we see the heterogeneity and the, the large areas where are MIBG non -arbitrary. So, are we missing viable neuroblastoma? Is the question. There's no apparent correlation of uh, uptake with DWI, EDC, differentiated content enhancement. So, is MIBG, it clearly seems not to be the same as FPG, not to be a marker of aggressiveness, but uh, probably a marker of tumor viability. And clearly, it's some inconvenience with patients, not available in many countries, etc. Now, now I have uh, I have uh, a few slides on PET, but I don't know how we are doing with time yeah, because uh, uh, um, let me know. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah, yeah. I can. You know, as I said, PET, we we don't have PET on site, so my experience with PET is less extensive than with the MIBG spec CT because, uh, but we do see some patients that refer to UCH and they send the image, the image to us. As I mentioned before, we have these particular imaging traces, FDOPA, MIBG, L124, and FPG, and uh, non capital imaging traces. So the, the, the main point is that these ones are more specific and the other ones are less specific. Yeah. So uh, you can see here FDG um, has, has certainly been used. I think it's most useful in patients where chemotherapy has not started yet. So if we is a neuroblastoma is exposed to chemo and then you do an FDG, then the chemotherapy stuns the cells. And so you induce FDG and then you have the uh, reactive uptake in the bone marrow, which really makes interpretation of disease versus reactive changes quite difficult. So, so, for example, what has been shown is that uh, the more our FDG RV the primary is, the worse the prognosis. So, it seems to be a marker. Uh, this is, yes, is a marker of aggressiveness. It's a marker of, as you can see here in the study, uh, that uh, from, I think it was, uh, uh, I'm sure it was uh, Korea, Japan, I'm sure. Anyway, the, the, the more RV uh, update uh, was associated with the uh, worse prognosis. But this is, as I mentioned, this is the main pitfall of, of FDG. That following chemotherapy at the end of induction chemo, you have very prominent uptake in the bone marrow, and it's quite difficult, it can be quite difficult to distinguish metastatic disease from, from reactive changes. Mm -hmm. uh, the somatostatic analog traces is a potentially very interesting uh, compound because also this molecular radiotherapy is tied with the tissue dot date. Yeah, and uh, uh, we have some examples. For example, this patient of ours here uh, uh, had the, uh, after achieving complete remission with following uh, chemotherapy and the surgery, and then at some point developed intense pain in the left thigh. The MIBG was entirely normal. The MRI was grossly abnormal, and you can see here. And uh, and the daughter Tate, look at look at this such a prominent uptake there. So MIBG negative and daughter Tate strongly positive it was treated with molecular therapy with, with improvement. But on the other hand, you can have uh, neuroblastoma cells that are MIBG avid and daughter Tate non avid. You can see this is an example here with subclural disease in this uh, metastatic involvement of the right uh, thorax. Yeah, you get very avid uh, MIBG uptake. And on the other hand, the daughter Tate picks up many other areas which are missed on MIBG. So, so the, the question is, are they complementing each other? Do we, should we do both? And so this shows uh, this uh, MIBG SPECT, uh, so called probably clear images here, FDG. And, and that's like the main point with daughter Tate is a lack of specificity. So for example, you can wonder whether this focal area here is a disease, is it reactive changes, etc. But then this has got implications because a tiny little area, if disease, if it's the only one, can make a change. So it becomes a metastatic disease. So it's an it, 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 it important pitfall of, of the daughter date scan. The ectopa is, unfortunately, in the UK, is not so very, very expensive, but it's been tested by many other groups. So this is 
this is how a, a nova is situated here. It's quite early on in the catecholamine pathway here, just before the, the, the formation of neuroepinephrine, and it's quite similar to a nova So this group in Italy, that they, they've done extensive studies, you can see a nova, the, the typical archaic in the base of Gambia there, and they, they found that DOPA to be superior to MIBG, also partly because of PET technology, superior to the spectral technology. And they also, uh, this group here from, from uh, um, South Korea, they, they uh, did some studies of comparing the viability of MIBG, you can see it strongly, and the viability of DOPA. And they found that if it, the, 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 the primer was more of more FDG of it than ectopa of it, this was worse the prognosis protection. So confirming that FDG avidity in the primary tumor is, is not good news. MIBG, I do want to fall pet. The main problem with this is a high radiation dose, I think. Interesting, potentially the longer half-life which comes with the clearly high radiation dose. And the decay you I do want to fall is quite complex. So is 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 uh, so uh, it's, it's been shown to be better than it might be expect. Mm -hmm. uh, this to me is a very interesting uh, proposition because this group from Utrecht in the Netherlands are uh, a pioneer, the MFBG. So basically it's a, the main structure of the MIBG molecule is the same. The only thing is labeled with fluoride 18. So this means that the imaging is done one hour after tracer injection and not 24 hours. No fire blockade is needed. You know, and um, and you've got this, the, the same molecule. So the, the, the distribution can be used for molecular radiotherapy, the RD131. And, um, and you've got the advantage of PET technology, which is much better than spectral technology. So this is really the, uh, I, mean, I think this is a, the best news on the horizon that, uh, that is happening now. So just to conclude now, this is really uh, uh, the end. So uh, MIBG remains an old spec CT, really a cornerstone at present. You know, the high specificity, very interesting, the theranostic potential. Now, as I mentioned a number of times, uh, the spec CT has shown this heterogeneity in Ublastone, a patchy uptake, are we missing this is? And probably it's not a mark of aggressiveness. Now, I think there's got implication for molecular radiotherapy because uh, if we see strong uptake in a tumor, and then this tumor turns to be a benign tumor. It's not, it's not oh, a benign variant. Is benign variant responsive to molecular radiotherapy? And Marika, who knows? Maybe not. Now, clearly, we know that, uh, for example, gangrioblastoma intermix doesn't treat red mark with chemotherapy. Yeah? So maybe the same with molecular radiotherapy. So uh, with MIBG uptake, does it necessarily mean that that uptake will respond to molecular radiotherapy? I'm not sure we have to, it is an, an area for further development. On the other hand, as I mentioned, the PET technology is very interesting, it's superior to SPECT, and clearly a PET trace will be very interesting, and clearly catecholaminergic PET trace, and MFDG will be, will be uh, especially interesting. So neuroblastoma, and you see biological heterogeneity. So in some area, do we need a cocktail of tracer if we see that quite a lot of disease is missed by one tracer only? Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. This is uh, the team. And the good news of your eyes is that, gosh, Cancer Center uh, that is going to be a, hopefully, a major pediatric hole uh, for not only the UK, but also further afield. Great, thank you very much.